calle, te hablo desde la prisión, Wilson Mayoma. There we go, Masters and Elm Podcast, episode 161, and today is a very, very, very special episode of the podcast. So first, let's get some announcements out of the way before we introduce our guest. Shout out to Birdo and Twiz that are not here today, because why? If you notice, our set is different, everything's a little different, because we are remote today in Cape Cod. Special episode. So real quick, guys, we appreciate everybody getting a chance to watch all the videos, all the video versions of the podcast on YouTube, on Twitch, on anywhere that you can uh, that you can find the video version of podcast. We're probably there. But if you can't watch the video version, we are available on all audio platforms, including now. We're proud to say iHeartRadio. So you can watch us. uh, Rather, you can listen to us there. Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Play Store, Stitcher, Podbean. And if you do not find us on your favorite preferred podcast platform for audio consumption, you can hit us up in the Discord and we will add our podcast to whatever platform you prefer because we want to be on all of them. So uh, without further ado... I would like to introduce today's guest, very special, oh. very special person. Um, in my life, anyway, I consider this man to be an inspiration, a mentor. He's going to get, uh, yeah, honestly. And, um, you know, he's doing a lot. He's up here based in Cape Cod. He's got a lot of stuff going on from being the owner of one of the best restaurants up here, according to many publications. We're talking about Cape Cod Times. We've got um, Cape Cod Life Magazine, What's Good Cape Cod, which is a YouTube channel that also featured the restaurant. He's the owner of the doghouse and uh, my big cousin, Mr. Mike Martier, and he's here with me live co-hosting. Mike. Hey. What's going on? Yeah, man? Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. Yes. Big shout out to Twiz and Birdo. Big fans. <laughs> big fans. So here we are in Cape Cod. Here we are, man. Remote. Cape Cod. Hit me. That's it, man. And uh, and it is beautiful here. I'm coming off of just winning three straight cornhole games. I'm the cornhole champion of this <laughs> of this here family getaway. <laughs> But um, we do want to jump in and, and get some stuff going. It's a long time coming. Mm. It's a long time coming. Mm. We've been talking about doing this episode for a while, and I'm glad we finally got it going. Uh, and we're not live. Right. We're not live. Uh, I would be trolling if we were. <laughs> yeah. I'd be trolling the comments. Hard. That's right. That's right. He jumps in our comments from time to time and keeps us on our toes, which is awesome. So, uh, yeah, I wanted, to get a, I wanted to get a couple of things, uh, you know, first of all, I did a a bit of an introduction on you, but uh, if you could just give us a little bit of an idea of one, how you ended up here Mm. in Cape Cod, because you did grow up in New York. Facts. You know, uh, so how you ended up here and then also how the doghouse kind of came to be. Uh, that's a lot. That's a lot. Is that a lot? Well, that's all right. It's like episode (laughs) one in a comic book, man. Let's get to it. it. (laughs) Bit bit by the spider. So uh, um, I was born and raised in New York City, Manhattan. Uh, uh, Inwood, Washington Heights. That's the upper part of the island. Um, without getting into like the crazy, really long background of 36 years in hospitality. Um, it started out, uh, we, to, to backtrack, so I don't want to get too far ahead of me. I worked for a lot of people, a lot of different people, like before Food Network was interesting. Um, I'm friends with a lot of people that people know, like Gordon Ramsay and Emerald and all those cats. Um, but I came up uh, working at the the James Beard Awards and James Beard House, where I met my wife. Uh, I worked at a lot of restaurants in New York City, um, Danielle, Le Cirque. Uh, I worked in Paris for a little while. Um, I was Julie Child's assistant for about a year. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. so I, I got a little bit, I don't really talk about that much, even in the The publications you mentioned, they always ask me, and I'm always like trying not to talk too much about it. It's just not my thing. Yeah. Um, I got recruited to move up here to run a resort that was uh, trying to be the best resort in the country. And that was in 2000. Um, My wife and I moved up here. Uh, We ended up achieving mobile five-star status in six years, which may sound like a long period of time. It's a long, arduous process to get there. Yeah. And then I had a consulting business in food manufacturing world, helping quick service restaurants. Like I helped build Chipotle, I helped build Five Guys, I helped build all kinds of California Pizza Kitchen, you name it. Um, I probably 
work with someone or something there. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then I sold it, uh, and we wanted to. I needed to spend time with my family. Like I went to work one day, and my kids were five and seven, and I came back, and they were fourteen and eleven. You know what I mean? It just wasn't good. Sure, sure. Um, so we did that. I was kind of not doing anything, really bored. My wife was at the time taking care of someone who was suffering from ALS. Uh, their brother-in-law owned the restaurant. They were looking to sell. They were older. She said, it's probably a great thing for you to do. So we fast forward. We bought the place. Completely rebranded it, redid it, because I can't help myself. I'm of like course. A, I'm like a pit bull. Like, I got to <laughs> just next level everything. Um, my children were going to go to school, so the deal was they would work there. I didn't want them to take any loans out in college. And they'd work seven days a week, open and close. And then in September, we'd write the check for their school. Yeah. So uh, I was fortunate that you... My oldest son graduated Mass Maritime with like $3,000 in loans, nothing. Oof. Um, lucky, lucky. Yeah, my youngest uh, son, Michael, decided to become an electrician. There you go. Which is okay. Yeah, listen, it's better than okay. Yeah, man. yeah. You know, a lot of us <laughs> wish we did that instead. Yeah. You know. So I, it's a fa it's kind of a the Cliff Notes version. Yeah. Um, but we have owned the doghouse for five years. Okay. Um, and like you mentioned, this year we were the... We got nominated as top three family friendly restaurants on the entire Cape. So it's a big, big accomplishment. Big shout out, kudos to my staff because really they're the ones that make it happen. I'm just, a, I'm just a facilitator. Yeah. At that point. So yeah, that's awesome. You see, and that's a rarity, and that's another reason that I respect this man. Is is you know he shares the credit, gives the credit where it's due, and he understands the concept of no business runs itself, and no business can run without good help. You know, so Facts. I love that. So uh, one interesting point about the doghouse is it is seasonal, correct? Definitely. 110 days. Yeah. So uh, what is that like kind of is that, um, you know, when you, when you have a seasonal business, number one, you got to make those months count. Definitely. Right. You got to, cause that's got to get you through the rest of the year. Definitely. And, uh, and you know, so is there downtime in between seasons or is it constantly kind of like preparing for the upcoming season? Uh, you know, that's a loaded question. So th there is some downtime, obviously we're not open, Yeah. um, to, to kind of work on the brand portion and the, you know, if you want to call it the success of the business, there was a lot of background work that had to be done. Um, a lot of social media work, a lot of staffing, um, culture commitments is what I'd like to call it. Um, a lot of issues with uh, getting pricing lined up and getting contractual pricing with vendors. And uh, if there's any menu changes, d working on different menu offerings, um, you know, they, the trick with a really good restaurant mix is you want to take what I like to say, like skew rationalization, which is all the products that you have in a restaurant. And then you do a menu gap analysis, which is all the offerings you have. Um, and then you overlay it with uh, what's on trend. And if you overlay those three circles, what's in the center typically is what is successful. Okay. Um, so it takes time to, to, to work on uh, that kind of information. Sure. Okay. Awesome. And then, um, you know, I know Birdo's here with us in spirit. Facts. Birdo. You know, <laughs> very sad. You're not here. <laughs> yeah, man. So, uh, so he had a couple things that he wanted me to, to touch on with you. And I think, uh, one of them was like super compelling when he brought it up to me is, mm. is the concept of, of retaining staff for a seasonal gig like that. Yeah. Or just recruiting staff in general. So, so how do you, you know, is there a certain kind of demographic that you find is easier to get, you know, in terms of age or something like that? Or how, how do you go about uh, getting and retaining your, your people? Well, that, we do it twofold, right? So the number one thing we work on is culture, right? I always like to, even when I did consulting, especially when they're older people, I always say, you know, being the smartest person in the room is important. Having high IQ, but having really good EQ is more important, which is an emotional intelligence factor, right? So the typical things that people understand is like respect each other, open communication, transparency, and we embrace all those things. The difficult part is actually day-to-day -day doing that. Um, I always tell the people at work there, like no one cares what you know until they know you care. Um, so you could just say, you could manage people and just make them do things and micromanage them but there never really is any buy-in from them. Um, and so 
I think what's important is when we hire, um, we, I, during the interview process, I'm always speaking about that culture. I'm always talking about transparency. I'm always talking about being open and honest with each other. I'm always talking about the culture of our team. Um, and we've been very fortunate that the people we hire, you know, they are in school. So the average age is like 15 to 22. Okay. Um, I think the oldest person that one time was like 27. Um, and so they're usually in school. Our rule is once you graduate college, you can't come back. You have to go be an adult. Whatever you went to school for, you have to go do that, be an adult. Okay, sure. Um, so every year we usually lose like one or two people. Um, and so we advertise for one or two spots. The, the side note to that is when we do advertise that we're looking for people, we get like 350 applications. <laughs> and then we have to, you know, focus through that. And many times the decisions even get on the phone with me and talk is if I can tell by the information you provided, if you're going to fit in with the team, I'm more protective of the team than I am about hiring a body. I got you. I would rather just be not open one less day. If my team had to suffer by someone that doesn't fit into the culture. Gotcha. Right. Like you don't want to bring Russell Westbrook in and destroy the team dynamic. Yeah. You know, right. just send them to Brooklyn. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. Um, I like that. And I, you mentioned something that I found interesting is, uh, that there's a, you always have a plan for them to move on from this. Always. You want them to, you know, to kind of spread their wings and, and graduate from that, you know, that position in their life. Like if you went to college and you have a degree, go do that. Like your goal is not to stunt their growth and keep them working for you forever. No. You want to see them kind of flourish. Absolutely. We teach them the basics. You know, we teach them all the things, all the buzzwords that you hear about or read about, Birdo. Talk to me now. <laughs> all, them, all them fancy books you read out there talking about them words like determination and focus and purpose. You know, we teach all those things every day and, and day in and day out. And we tell them while we ask a lot of you here, these skills will transfer to anything you do in life. Right. So, you know, we always say ease is a greater threat than pr to progress because if everything was easy, you'll never really truly progress, right? To get bigger to work out, you lift weights. Sure. To do jujitsu, you got to roll. That's yeah, just yeah. how it is. You, there's no other way around it. Um, and so we, we, the managers that we have now, they know from me, like you have to lead from the front. Trains have to pull. They have to pull everybody with them. Uh, and that's how we get buy-in in our culture. They know that everybody there is an important cog in the rest of the team and that no one is slacking there. Um, it's like managing a pack of wolves, you know, they kind of self-manage themselves. If they're with in the entire time we've owned the doghouse, we've only had to let two people go. Wow. And both of those people, I asked them if I could help them find a job. They yeah. just don't fit with us. Sure. Doesn't mean they're a bad person. Yeah. They're just, we could, I know a lot of people, I'd love to help you get a job. Um, but the, you can tell right away that the culture sometimes just doesn't fit. Maybe it's just too much or maybe in your life right there, you're just not willing or you don't see the other side, you know, the forest for the trees, so to speak. You don't see the lessons that we're teaching you. And sometimes you don't have to. Sure. You just have to, we have to get you to just buy into it. Yeah. Yeah. All right. See, that's uh man. I just love that philosophy. Just that you, you know, you're, you're, it's almost, like, it makes me think of like the hinge app, you know, right. how like hinges, right. like it's designed to be deleted. Right. You know what I mean? They want you to move on from that. They want so. you to move on. Like we do different you know, when you, everybody were, starts at the same level and the way we do it is you progress to the next station once you've mastered the previous station. The other side of that coin is once you get to the next station, we give you a raise. We tell them if you're in a job and you're doing a lot of work and you have to ask for a raise, that's a red flag. Yeah. It's a very simple equation. You do more, you should get more. Yeah. So that falls on us. So a lot of guys, they know that. Some guys will get three, four raises in one season in a hundred days because they've progressed, they've massed and moved on. Some people are happy at the station they're at and that's fine too. Sure. Um, and some people uh, maybe only go one or two stations, but they're always given, you know, I'm always pulling them aside. I'm like, hey, great work. You're going to be starting this after a week. You're, you're going to see a raise in your paycheck. So, and they see it like it's, yeah. it's live. It's no. Yeah. No phony, no, no, no BS. This is a drama free zone. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. And, uh, and I know I remember, um, that, uh, I had heard you, you know, uh, we had discussed previously kind of an employee, uh, what is it? Employee of the month kind of thing mm. that you guys do. And it's yeah. almost like a 360. Yeah. So we do. Deal. So the managers get to nominate someone, um, every month, like whoever they think is the hardest worker. And then it's on a white board 
and then all the other workers get one vote. So if you win, it's actually you being recognized by your fellow workers that you are working hard. Gotcha. And then what we do is uh, what we give you is something very specific to you. So one of the lessons we teach the managers, again, no one cares what you know till they know you care. We try to find out what they like to do outside of work. And then no one knows what the prize is except for me. And then it's always appropriate to that person's interests. For example, uh, one year we had a guy who was a big gamer and we bought him an Oculus. Nice. Just, just recently, this new guy, uh, Will, uh, overwhelmingly won, like, I think everyone's vote except for one. And he's like a serious math nerd. So I bought him a 3D printer. Oh, nice, like, man. Last year, someone plays golf. We got him golf clubs. Like, they're over-the-top prizes. Like, yeah. way beyond. There's no. We're not like, here's a $25 gift card to Duncan. Good job. That's just yeah. whack. Or here's a, you know, a, a yeah. mug with our business logo exactly. on it that we got from Positive Promotions right. or, or whatever. Nobody wants you know? that. And yeah. even the person giving that in any situation knows that that is just whack. Yeah. You know, and so... You know, we're top to bottom, bottom to top, culture driven. Yeah. Every aspect, every angle of it. And, you know, the staff knows it. And I think a lot of times people treat staff like they're idiots. Yeah. Like they're smarter than them. Sure. Um, and regardless of the age, they're not. No, they're not. <laughs> they're man. just as smart as you, if not smarter. Yeah, man. You know, it's like going in, you know, you underestimate the white belt. Meanwhile, the white belt has like a better mount escape <laughs> than yeah. anybody in the room. And yeah. it's just this one thing that he's solid on, you know. And I think that respect translates in during their work period because obviously we're very busy. Yeah. Um, it's, it's not, you know, deep in it. It's not a difficult job, but it does require an intense focus when it's happening. Yeah. Um, and I think that because we have a respect with them and because our culture is very transparent and open, they know that when it's, you know, when, when the set calls, they, you expect it to rock. You know what I mean? They, they know when it's time to go, it's time to go. Yeah, for sure. Um, and they're willing. And so, you know, we're very fortunate to have that for sure. Yeah. For sure. I mean, you know, uh, being fortunate and also being the people that cultivated that culture, that's a, that's a big deal because I've been there many times yeah. to the doghouse. Food's incredible. And we're going to have the information, uh, you know, social media and uh, all that stuff linked in the description of the video. So you guys can check that out. But um, I've been there and I don't see unhappy staff. Everybody's no. having a good time. I don't see anybody sitting around while somebody else is carrying the majority of the work. Never. You know, you, you don't see that. And I think that that um, it speaks to not only your character as an employee, as a, an employer and an owner, but you're back there with the guys. No doubt. You know, you're back there with them. You know how hot it is. Not cause they told you, <laughs> you know how hot it is back there. Cause you're sweating back there too, that's man. Right. That's right. You know, and that's uh, and it's always, I find that anytime I've been employed by a leadership person that's willing to get in there and help get their hands dirty, roll their sleeves up. It always makes you want to work that much harder because they get it. Right. You know, so all the emotional uh, evoking when you're watching a movie, <laughs> whatever you're into that moment when that guy leads everyone and in your mind, you just feel a certain way. That's how it is. Yeah. Right. That, that's yep. the reason why you feel that way. Yeah. Right. And you feel that when you're there, at least I, I like to think they do. Yeah. Um, if they didn't, it wouldn't execute. So I have to believe that they do. Exactly. And execution is big. I've learned that, you know, that's a topic that, that you and I have, have touched on over time and just the, you know, great ideas happen every day, huh. but it's not every day that somebody executes said idea. That's right. You know, it's almost like a, like a bad idea executed is better than a great idea that sat in your brain, right. you know, um, no doubt. no doubt. Yeah. So I do, I have witnessed a huge growth in your social media presence mm. over the last couple of years. So yeah. I know that there's been a lot of research, a lot of work, a lot of learning, a lot of tutorial things that you've pursued in order to learn this. So, right. so, um, you know, if you want to tell us a little bit about your social media, um, kind of what that impact has been on the business in terms of the growth of the, of the Instagram and stuff, mm. cause you do big on Facebook as well. Mm. Uh, so has that impacted your business? And if it has, is it a positive? Is it a negative? Is it, you know, cause I, I've seen it. So yeah, yeah. Uh, it definitely took a lot of work. It probably took around 16, 18 months of really just studying the algorithm and a lot of data reading, you know, 
obviously Instagram, Facebook, all those, they give you all the analytics. Yeah. They give you all the information. It's what you do with it. Sure. I've dialed it down to where I've taken the analytics and kind of figured out what our true demographic is. And previous, when we first bought it, our demographic was much older. Um, you know, hot dogs. Uh, yeah, yeah. The previous owner was older. So uh, the vibe and the feel was older. Uh, and we wanted a younger crowd. And we revamped it to offer much more fun, younger products, like cool things. Um, and so part of that rebranding was going into social and trying to move that, the analytics that were on there, the age group and the male, female from that 45 to 65 to bring it down to like 18 to 35 or 25 to 45. Um, and a lot of that was, you know, learning how the, obviously the algorithms, even though Facebook goes Instagram, they're still different, very different. Yeah. Uh, what they allow you to do is very different, you know. YouTube and Google and all those analytics are all, they're all competing with each other, but they're very different, but not, they all have similarities, meaning you can run reels and you can run paid ads and you can run um, stories. You can, and then you have to take that data and figure out how to blend it. Um, and I've gotten some really good traction learning uh, when these certain things are ran run together um, or, how much time is in there, meaning the time zones that we post. A lot of people use calendars that automatically post stuff, which is fine, but it's a little bit like aseptic. You know, it's like really clean. Yeah. And we, obviously the algorithm learns that. It just gets fat. If you always post in at 5.05 a.m., it learns that. And you might not get that level that you want. So a lot of it is done live. Like I'm doing it and changing up, trying to mess with it. Yeah. Um, and then supporting it with in, for Instagram, for example, which has our biggest following has like 41,000 followers. Um, that is unreal. Yeah. We, it, that was more like learning how paid ads, reels, stories, the time you post it, uh, and dialing it in with Facebook kind of as the umbrella. Yeah. Cause even though they're separate, they do work together. Yeah. Um, and, it's boring as hell because uh, a lot of data you got to read. Sure, man. But it does work. Yeah, and know? they provide the data to you. Free. So everybody can do that. I mean, everybody. we're guilty of it ourselves, honestly, between me and Berto with the podcast that, you know, that uh, we could be doing more, admittedly, For with sure. analytics because they're there. It's not like, you know, previously they, that wasn't a thing before. You can just... No access analytics for a TV commercial that, that right. you had, I'm sure, you know, it's, um, you know, like our paid ads, for example, like let's say a newspaper guy comes, he's like, Hey, we want you, especially on the cable. Hey, we want to, want you to buy advertising ad. And you say, okay. And their package is like 12 weeks, four times a week. You get these digital impressions, blah, 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 all the stuff. And I'm like, okay, so how many people actually see it? And they're like, well, it goes out to a hundred thousand subscribers. And you're like, okay, but how many people actually see it? Yeah. They can't tell you that number. No. And they're mad expensive and you got to commit to the three month window. Whereas you could run one ad for $5, $100, $200. And for X amount of one day, two days, five days, whatever. And as soon as it's over, you instantly tells you who actually looked at it, how long they looked at it. If it's a real, how long they viewed it, if they skipped it, if they exited, if they unfollowed you, if they fought, they give you everything you can see. Gotcha. And then you can just dial it. You can be like, okay, that sucked or some aspect of that was good. And then the next one you do, you just, that's why it took so long. Yeah. You know what I mean? It was like, I had to keep redeveloping the same different posts, but I had to keep dialing it in to just, and I, the analytics started to support it. Okay. So like women is our 51% of the viewers between 35 and 45. That's like our number one viewer. Okay. And if I, and I, I, I tested that theory, you know, like proof of concept where I started to run either a paid ad or a post that was specifically designed to hit that group and the analytics blew up even more. So I was like, okay, that's one. Sure. Then I started dialing in on the 18 to 25 males and some of my reels had like different rap music, more modern. Yeah. And that blew up and I said, okay, that's that. You know, and then I started dropping them in alternatively and the algorithm just started putting it higher and higher and higher. Gosh, but it took a long time to get there. That's why some in the beginning it was kind of like hokey because I was trying so much stuff 
And some of the young kids at work were like, yo, that post was whack. Yo, that yeah. was it. Yo, it was fire. <laughs> that was it. I started learning all this. I'm like, okay, well, what are you guys looking at? And then I started. The other thing is part of the culture is I'm 52 years old. Yeah. Right? <laughs> I ain't gonna lie, dude. I'm 52 years old. Yeah. I know. I don't, Looks damn good. I but. know them creams and, lo and fancy creams and lotions make magic happen. Yeah. But <laughs> I look at what they're, I'm interested in what an 18 year old or a 20 year old or a 22 year old, what they're listening to, what album is dropping, who they're checking on SoundCloud, what they're watching on YouTube. Like, I'm truly interested in that. I'm not judging them like most people my age do judge young people. Sure. I think they got it all figured out. Yeah. But they don't. That's not music. Back in my day, right. it's, you know. Right. Yeah. Mac Miller who? Yeah. yeah. Like, <laughs> but the point is, like, I'm interested in that. You know, is some of the stuff, am I, am I like, constantly checking it out? No. Do, do I like Kendrick Lamar? He's okay. Yeah. But ask around how many 52-year-olds even know that Kendrick Lamar is. Yeah, that he exists at all. You know, <laughs> and I can walk into a party and I can sing the Eagles, too. Yeah, because <laughs> I'm 52. So, but the point is, a lot of that stuff is I take it into consideration when I'm doing posts because it's appropriate to the social. Yeah, meaning Instagram is appropriate. TikTok is a different demographic. Facebook is, you know, where people who just learn about social go to die. But beyond yeah. that, <laughs> you know, that it's still important for your business. You still need the traction because Facebook and Instagram they all work together. Yeah. Um. And so, it's taken some time. Yeah. I haven't. I'm not like perfect at it. But it's definitely gotten better, obviously. Yeah. But you are good. And I see the posts and you put time in these posts. Oh. I mean, there's there's um some of them are funny. You know, yeah, some are funny, some are um dead ass serious. You know, dead serious, <laughs> you know. Sometimes you're out there straight up. I saw one you did the other day where it was just all about supporting your staff. Like, yes. you know, do not come here and be mean to my staff don't be rude to my staff yeah, like man. you know and i thought that was i couldn't imagine another business that would be willing to say hey listen my staff matters they're important to me and they kind of matter just as much as the customer like so do they not, are number one yeah they're people say one, the customer is first that's a myth yeah right you're in any business let me say this to everyone out there <laughs> the customer is important right it drives revenue and growth you need to have a transactional experience but that doesn't happen without your staff yeah i don't know why that's even so hard to figure out like if you mistreat them if you disrespect them if you uh don't hold them to a higher plane then you should not be surprised when your customer gets that same experience that's how it works yeah man um there's really no other way around it no and, and again man this is it just speaks to the culture and this is why you get people you know, that are willing to, to, that they are giving you the buy-in, you For know, sure. as, as an employee. I mean, it, there's a, we just had a talk the other night, like right around the fire about, you know, working in places where, where, you know, the manager will come out and just humiliate you in front of the customer, even though Never. the customer may be a hundred percent wrong with whatever they're claiming or whatever they're requesting. And, uh, and there's so many business owners or, or, you know, or in my experience, at least leadership figures that, um, are so quick to just, kind of take the customer's side without even hearing the scenario. And it's like, listen, really, you're right here. Right. You know, we empower them. We empower them to make a decision uh, that's appropriate to the situation. If it's not what we would have done, we wait till after the shift and say, hey, we probably wouldn't have done it like this. We do it like this. We never berate them in front of the customer. And quite frankly, if the customer feels like they want to escalate their experience of negativity towards my staff, I'm happy to return their dollars and tell them to bounce. Yeah. That's just speaking a little more on the, on the customer base. I know that Cape Cod is a very big vacation mm. spot. It's, you know, it's, uh, it's so funny. I see those bumper stickers that are like, we are not on your vacation. Yeah, man. For real. So, <laughs> yeah, I know it's got to be crazy to just every summer just have, you know, your hometown kind of overrun Swell. with people from all over the place. Yeah. You know, so so what's the what's that like dealing with so many customers that aren't even local They're there? Because I don't know if there's many businesses that can understand that concept. You know, it's like um, mm. it's almost like you're working at you know, you're running a business almost at like an all inclusive resort or something like that, where it's constantly just an influx of, of non locals, uh, during a majority of the season. Am I accurate in that? Assumption? Yeah. Fresh faces. Yeah. yeah fresh faces, people yeah. that aren't from around. Um, so, you know, is there anything that you notice that's a little different about that versus like, you know, the 
tail end of the summer where it's probably a little more local. Local summer, we call it. Uh, yeah. Oh, uh, that's right. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Local summer in September. Um, do you notice anything like that or do you, you know, is there anything really to take away from there? Yeah. I mean, you could definitely tell when it changes the expectation of the customer changes because they come from, you know, a different city or whatever, different state, a different country. Yeah. Um, we kind of are able to combat that just by staying consistent. Sure. You know, we're consistent. We put the product out that's consistent. So do we match or exceed their expectation? I think so. Sometimes, not always. Um, but what their demand is can definitely dramatically change. Okay. Definitely dramatically change. Yeah, sure. I'm sure it's uh it's gotta be pretty different dealing with like a you know, a, a local person versus like some guy from like the middle of Brooklyn or like the middle, you know, where it's high pace and it's fast pace. And right. like, listen, I want my, they're used to getting their chopped cheese, you know, I'm right, right. getting my chopped cheese in like five minutes, you know? <laughs> yeah. We, we say happiness is your reality minus your expectation. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I love that, man. So, um, I also wanted to ask like, you know, while we're, while we're touching on this, like what, is there a huge seller? that you have there? Like the number one item people buy? Like, is there, is there, cause I meant to ask that before. I'm like, what would be the big seller? Cause I know food or drink. Cause there's two categories. Yeah. True. True. Um, how about uh drink wise? Cause you guys do actually have uh you guys serve alcohol. We do. Beer you and know, wine. Yeah. yeah. Beer and wine, which is, yeah. which is big because uh, you know, as far as I know, there's not many outdoor seating areas, majority that, that have that kind we're of, we're the only one, we're the only one on Cape that were, that was awarded a beer and wine license with no indoor seating. Look at that. Uh, it was definitely a challenge to deal with the state to try to get it and the town. Sure. And we've had zero violations since we've received that. Um, I would say our number one seller of drinks would probably be our Frosé program, which Frose. is out of control. Yeah. So stands for frozen rosé, in case y'all don't know. Yeah. So and anybody we, that doesn't know, this is like a, this is like a rosé Slurpee. Yes. You know, it's like a rosé And slush. we have different flavors and we flavor it differently and we do uh, crazy kooky stuff, strawberry watermelon. Uh, we do a hard lemonade. Nice. Uh, we do a strawberry lemonade. We do, uh, what else do we do? Cucumber. We do all kinds of weird that's right, yeah. Yes. And we sell them in, you know, 16-ounce pouch like a adult Capri Sun. Nice. So in a 32-ounce bottle. And yeah. we sell a 64-ounce bottle. You know, we call that the Uber bottle. Yeah, yeah. And uh, <laughs> that's a lot. Half a gallon. <laughs> the Uber bottle. Yeah, you're going to make some friends. <laughs> um, but that's probably our, definitely our number one. But we don't sell any major common brand beers. Yeah. We, so, we only serve, you know, local on the Cape breweries or just off Cape breweries um they're very small we don't do any Budweiser no Bud Light no Heineken no Miller Light no none of that stuff no Chicolo we don't sell none of those things that's it um <laughs> Chicolo if we if you want something <laughs> light we have it you know we have like a uh, hard seltzer you know if it's under five percent ABV we can sell it so we have like uh you know vodka sodas that are like 3.5 and Nice. Like refreshing. We're not a watering hole. You know, you bring your family there. You need to take the edge off. Kids run around acting crazy, having a hot dog. You could have one. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And we definitely don't have people just hanging out. Yeah. It's not that kind of place. Good, good. Which, you know, keeps all the craziness out. Exactly. You know what Our I mean? Our number one food probably is like our West Dennis dog. The West Dennis. And what's on the West Dennis? Remind me. It's mac and cheese, Woo. fried onion rings, bacon bits. S somewhere buried in there is a hot dog on a bun. There you go. Our my personal favorite to bring New York here is the Reuben Dong, which I know is your favorite. Oh, you know how I feel about that, yeah, man. So that thing's pretty tasty. Yeah, pastrami cheese, crowd, Thousand Island. It's pretty tasty. Yeah, that is delicious. I had uh, what I have? I had the Fourth of July the other day. Nice, which is coleslaw. Good. Oh yeah, fried onion rings, barbecue sauce, bacon bits, bacon. Yeah, bits. we definitely don't have anything normal. You know, yeah. we, we have over the top fun products, summer products, um, things that you know, younger demographic would like, you can still get a plain dog. We're cool with that. Happy yeah. to sell you a plain dog burger. Yeah. We got those. We also have like fun things. We have like loaded tots, like loaded fries. We, things that, you know, like our poor carnita fries has like poor carnitas and pico and guac and uh, chipotle aioli, like all in one box. And it's massive and it's a meal for three people. And yeah, um, people love it. They those truffle tots are bomb too. Yeah. Tots are a thing, man. Tots, they're, they are damn good and they're consistent, dude. 
Yeah, every time. They are consistent. I have not. That's that's something I got to say. Every time I get something from there, it is on the money. And you've probably had it from every single time you've been there. It's been cooked by someone else. Which is crazy to me. Right. You know, that that's crazy to be able to to have that consistency. It reminds me of of a franchise restaurant, you yeah. know, that's that's got it so dialed in that even when they pop up new locations, those new locations make it the same way exactly. that there's no deviation from the expectation of what the quality is, the preparation, the presentation. Right. Um, and I had a lot of experience in my previous life doing that. Yeah. And that was always the success that I noticed. Like you go to five guys in New York, you go to five guys in Wisconsin, you go to five guys in Florida is the same burger. And I started with them when it was like nine locations, which is <laughs> now crazy. 1850 locations. That is and everyone serves the same exact burger. Yeah. So, yeah, that's, man, that's, that's nuts. I know, um, you know what, man, what I wanted to, uh, I know we already kind of strayed away from your background that's and stuff, right. but one of the things that I find over the top is, um, is some of the work that you did in Vegas. Mm, yeah. I did a lot of buffet work there. Yeah. Um, so I did like the win. I did the Bellagio Paris hotel, uh, yeah. treasure Island. Um, and I learned a ridiculous amount of psychological manipulation that those guys sure. have. Sure, like how man. They, you know, you come in there as a food service person and, you know, you, Bellagio's over the top, right? You want the best. They want it to be, have the best buffet on the strip. Sure. And there was no real budgetary limit. Yeah. So to a culinary guy, you're like, yes, yeah, it's time to party. There's yeah. no limit. Oh man, I'm going to get crazy. Yeah. And then you present this whole thing and then there's like a psychiatrist, a psychologist, and they're like, now nah, we got to do it like this. They totally change it around. Yeah. Um, based on how they want the customer to move. Yeah. Like, they create the reaction. Yeah. Like I had no idea when I was out there, but did you know that the average person can only eat about a pound and a half of food? No. Right. So all the expensive stuff in the back. All the mashed potatoes in the front. Uh -huh. If you all go to Vegas, look at those buffets. That's how they're set up. Yeah, you ain't going to get the crab legs right. in the beginning. By the time you get there, your plate is full, and it's yeah. on purpose. You know, granted, there's those guys that go and get another plate. You know what I'm talking about, Berto? Yeah. Go get a second plate, <laughs> and go get the good stuff. Yeah, but yeah. they definitely changed that. And that, um, it was, I was out there a lot, like yeah. probably four or five times a month, and I'm not a gambler. Yeah. It was like, you really got to see... Um, kind of like the madness of human nature and how they have the ability to manipulate that. It, 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 what I find so crazy about this is that I went to that resort, I, to that buffet at the Bellagio mm. way before I knew you had anything to do with it. Mm. I went there, we went to Vegas for my buddy's bachelor party. I'm going back like, I don't know, 15 years something yeah. like that, you know, and we went there and, and that was, we weren't even staying at the Bellagio, but we ate there every damn day. Oh, we yeah. were staying at the New York, New York. Yeah. Another crazy buffet. Yeah. So, and the Bellagio was crazy when we went there to eat, man, I couldn't believe it. It was mind blowing. And then, uh, and then when we were just chopping it up, when we were in, uh, we were in Puerto Rico when we talked about it and, uh, and we just touched base on this and I was like, wait a minute, what? I was like, you did that buffet? Yeah. It was crazy to me so i just uh yeah i just that was uh, that question was for me yeah that's you cool. know I, <laughs> you know um so uh also another thing when it comes to business especially over the past couple of years with um with the schman schmemic yeah going on and uh, <laughs> you know and all of the uh all that craziness that increased the cost of virtually everything yeah um you know uh, how was it doing, uh, you know, like, what's it like when you, cause you have to adjust pricing, right? You have to adjust pricing. You, we didn't for two years. Know, so you didn't, we didn't raise our prices. So you kind of ate the, you know, the cost, the extra cost. You guys kind of took that on the chin instead of kind of passing it off to the customer yeah, or yeah, we, you know, because my previous background had been in manufacturing, I had a lot of contact with guys that are higher up in manufacturing, like guys at Tyson and guys at Smithfield and, um, and it was legit. Like anybody out there who's denying that, any of that, you know, it was just people getting greedy. Sure, there was definitely some of that, uh, but there's only so much elasticity in the pricing. Uh, you know, if you if you logically step back and think, 
if there was a restriction on the ability of people being in a building, then imagine a kill facility. And I've been in every one in America, pigs, cows, you name it. You need a certain amount of bodies to do it. Like Smithfield, who I was the director of culinary for Smithfield is the largest vertically integrated pork producer on the planet, right? They kill yeah. 18 million hogs a year. And yeah. that requires a lot of bodies. Oh yeah. So if there's restrictions and bodies can't go in there, animals can't be killed. And so then they don't make it to the supermarket. Nope. And the only available animals that let's say they put up in the freezer is now priced higher because they still have to make, they still have bills to pay. They still have margins to make. They still have to, you know, in Smithfield's case, they have responsibility to the shareholders. Um, so, you know, was it greed? M maybe a small portion of it in the food world. Yeah. In the paper world, um, that's something slightly different. For example, everybody went to takeout, right? So paper was very expensive. So takeout to go boxes is made from wood pulp, right? So wood pulp comes from wood being manufactured to build houses. Yeah. Well, if houses aren't being built because of what was happening and they weren't allowed to be on site, then the wood pulp isn't being made. And the only little bit available of wood pulp to go to the paper manufacturer is now more expensive. Right? Supply and demand. Huh? Exactly. Yeah. Um, anything that's imported, you know, like for us, fryer oil to fry in, mm -hmm. a box of fryer oil takes two to fill a fryer, used to be $17 a box. Well, during that time period, it was almost $60 a box. Whoa. Yeah. So from $17 to $60? Right. So four fryers, right? You need two, four, six, eight boxes. Used to be 34, 34, 34, 34. Now it's 500, 600. <sighs> and we replace our oil every four days. And so does a lot of other restaurants on the Cape. So palm oil, which is the main ingredient to make fry oil, is produced out of India. Well, there's also a byproduct that India uses to feed their very poor population. And the president of India was like, I'm not exporting it anymore because I got to feed these people who are now not working. And so what's available is now more expensive. Again. You want to fry something? You need to change the oil. You can't use you can't use one fryer oil for the entire season. It just doesn't work that way. So did we eat it, you know, from a margin standpoint? Uh, yes, we definitely ate. Let's just say the margins weren't where they could have been. Um, we also felt responsible because people weren't making as much money. They still needed to feed their family. We didn't think it was fair to, you know, take advantage which some people, some restaurants were, they were definitely taking advantage, jacking up their prices because they were also trying to cover the cost increase and maintain their same margin. Um, you know, in the state of Massachusetts, uh, we're the largest employer of people in the state behind the government. We're the only industry targeted to be shut down. Wow. Out of all the industries, like you can still go to the supermarket, you can go to Home Depot. Yeah. There's no, they, they you can go to the liquor store. Yeah, it was facts. Yeah. But, Restaurants got targeted. So all those workers, you, you could talk all you want about stymies and all that, and they were getting money, but they only got one check. They weren't getting it every week. And there's a lot of people that got unemployed. Yeah. Um, and they still needed to eat. So we felt like it wasn't appropriate to raise pricing at that time. Um, we kept all, we were 100% com committed to our employees at the time. Nobody got laid off. Nobody, even if we did $500 in a day. Yeah. We just made payroll. <laughs> we made, wow. we just paid them. Um, and we felt that because of what we're committed to our culture to, we're committed to them when times get tough is when they find out if you lying. That's it. And so we found stuff for them to do and we cleaned a lot and scrubbed a lot and repainted a lot. And sure we serviced customers. We went, we got online and did online ordering. Um, but our pricing was, uh, we maintained our pricing. Yeah. But there definitely, there was some challenges with costs availability. Um, you know, if you're a very big account to a, a distributor, like a Cisco, or one of those guys, and you got first and then it trickled down. If you didn't spend that much with them, some guys, they would order and their truck wouldn't even show up. Oof. And let's not forget, like those distribution centers, you know, have 250 people working, loading their trucks. Well, now there's a restriction. They can only be 20 people in the building. They're not going to load the same amount of trucks. No, it's not possible. And the drivers can only be on the road for a certain amount of time. And if they 
run out of time, they drive back to Cisco and leave their truck there and you just don't get your food. Wow. So there was so many aspects people didn't even realize um, that made it very challenging. Yeah. We didn't change our pricing. So I guess that's the, the long bringing the wagons back around as they yeah. say. <laughs> yeah. But you know that, see, this is kind of, I feel like pulling back the curtain a little bit on, on what was going on from the inside. Yeah. You know, during this time, because a lot of, you know, a lot of us from the customer standpoint, you know, we don't get to get this explanation. We don't get to really right. know what was going on. So we're, it's purely speculation at that point. Absolutely. You know, we start to wonder, well, why are they raising prices? You know, this is BS. They're trying to take advantage of, you know, but really that oftentimes was not the case clearly. Right. You know, um, like McDonald's contract with the beef producer to get their burgers, they would never deny them their product because they're such a big customer. So if a beef manufacturer is only able to produce enough beef to give to, I'm just using it. I'm just, I'm a little bit making up, like give it to McDonald's. Yeah. I'm not going to get any hamburger meat. No. Sorry. Yeah. I mean the contract, like you're saying that, I mean the account's that big that to big. where you, you know, it's like almost like too big to fail. Like right. I, we cannot let these guys go under They're They're how we pay for our way of life, exactly. you know, um, as owners of the company. Yeah. Or, yeah. You know, um, we changed our menu a little bit, you know, we tweaked it to based on the availability of products. Um, we limited our hours to be open so that we were able to have the product of ready available to execute consistently when we had it. Yeah. So we were open like four, four days a week, um, limited hours. You know, we shut, we closed earlier cause a lot of people weren't going out to eat. So like the seven thirty dinner hour used to be like the power hour, but then people would just go home. Okay. So like we started closing earlier. So the hours were shorter and then, when they when we were open, we were very busy. I'm not going to lie. I mean, sure. we busy. Um, but it's a long road when you sell a hot dog um, to make money. For food, sure. I, I believe it. So, and that, you know, you just mentioned yet another aspect that, that I didn't even consider is like, based on the limitation of product, you got to switch the menu. Yeah. If you can't get any sauerkraut, you know, I mean, the, the pastrami dog is going to be different or the, or the Reuben dog or, or totally. you know, it's, um, you know, you're going to end up either leaving things off or changing items entirely. Right. You know, um, we weren't going to like give them less. Yeah. We're going to make the portion smaller. We yeah. We're going to like, you know, fill the chips with air and put a half of an ounce less, but it still looked like the same bag of chips. We're yeah. going to do that. Yeah. No. Um, we apologized a lot to people. Some people were very cool about it. Some not so much, but you know, it was a tough time for everybody. I mean, you had to do what you had to do. It was a life order. lesson for a lot of team members because they had to deal with, you know, an additional aspect of customer service, additional stress on the customer who sometimes would project it on them. Um, we still had a zero policy for that, like zero tolerance. Like, you know, if you're having that kind of a day that you got to yell at a 17-year-old girl because whatever. Yeah. Then you can whatever the hell off my property. That's right. But... They, you know, a lot of people were understood the challenges, maybe because of their industry or where they were in and they were, it was fine. Yeah. Challenging, but fine. Sure. All right. That's uh, you know, that's, that's great. And, and it's not only hot dogs you have. No, man. We do burgers, chicken. Yeah. Lobster rolls. Lobster rolls. Big time. Lobster rolls. I know there was a Cuban sandwich on there for a while. We had a Cuban. Yeah. That was like legit Cuban. Not legit. That, not that fake. You know, slice deli ham cube. You don't, you don't do that. <laughs> you know, I uh, I definitely did. Um, I one hundred percent can vouch for the Cuban sandwich. Yeah, legit. I had it multiple times. Um, so uh, and then you have something else on the horizon here that you guys are are working on. Oh yeah, we did. We we you know? uh, we acquired another property right across the street, a little bit down the street. Um, it's a different concept. Uh, it's a, used to be a convenience store that had been there for a very long time. Um, it was a little tired, you know, definitely the time period we're speaking about affected them greatly. Yeah. Um, you know, they couldn't, uh, in the vacation spot that this is located, that particular store could command a higher price for a similar commodity item you would purchase in a supermarket because this, sto this convenience store is the only one in that area close to the beach, you know, easy access, you walk there. So they could get a higher price, but because the, sometimes the prices were changing weekly. Yeah. There was no way they could maintain 
And so they, they limited their hours. They also lost business. Um, and so we had the opportunity to get it again. We're rebranding it, revamp it, full gut construction. And probably the number one driving factor was we had f four or five employees that need year round employment and this was going to be open year round. So yeah. again, it was a way to, you know, continue that culture, kind of reward them and keep in a way, keep them working and engaged. It is hard to go from zero to 60 and then you run and run and run and run and then go 60 to zero. Oh yeah. You know, becomes a devil's playground when you board. Oh yeah, absolutely, so, man. Uh, we, that was definitely a driving factor. Uh, we also saw an opportunity to kind of revitalize that particular uh, business um, and provide a service to a lot of the customers that do come to us. Obviously, we used to patronize them. And so we felt like we could rebrand it, make it fresh, new, provide a service to an area, expand the seasonality of it. Our employees benefit from it. Um, we have some really interesting employee benefits. Okay. Uh, like one of the, one of the publications that wrote about us is, uh, one of the things we have in this new venture is we offer similar to a 401k matching, which we do offer, which is crazy, right? Selling hot dogs. We, yeah. That, listen, we offer that, that. 401k matching, but what we do is a program to, there's a big housing issue on the Cape. Um, so a lot of places need workers. They need landscapers. They need plumbers. They need electricians, and they can't afford to buy a home on the Cape. That's a sidebar topic, which we could review if you want. But what we do is we we have a program where we will match, like a four hundred one k. If you put money into a kitty, and we that money is used to buy a house. So the way you get that money, it's like a vested period, just like a four hundred one k. Okay. You can, we'll match like 3% up to five, I think of your salary. And to get that money at the end, you have to go through a bunch of classes, learning about home ownership, learning about financing, learning about private mortgage insurance, learning about interest rates, learning. You have to prove that you are, we're not just going to give you a lump sum of money and be like, yeah, go buy a house. Good luck. Yeah. We have all this, this program set up so that you're learning everything you need to know that the bank ain't going to tell you. Of course not. Um, and so that you at least are well informed to purchase a home. Uh, people, depending on the age group, a lot of people say, oh, it's too expensive to live on the Cape. It's just too expensive to buy a house anywhere, but it is all relative. Yeah. Right. So yeah. You know, if you're 70 and you were like, my bought my house in 1948 for you know, $8,000, right. And you were making $22 a week. Yeah. Right. It's all relative. So can you afford a $650,000 house? Well, if you are 22 years old, you can FHA provides 3.5% as down payment. That's like $22,000. You can put $22,000. Are you going to have a high payment? Sure. It might be $3,500, but that's how much it is to rent. Yeah. So why really? are you trying to give that money to a landlord? Just struggle and give it to yourself. Yeah. If, if you want that. Sure. I'm not saying like home ownership is the way that's like a whole nother thing, but yeah, we do offer a way to try and support um, bringing workers back to the Cape because it can't like the Hamptons. Cause I lived out there too. It can't mm -hmm. just be all wealthy people. It yeah. can't, it's not possible. No, you know, you still need someone to cut your grass. Yeah. Unless it's you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, for sure. You still need a plumber. You still need an electrician. You still need a guy to clean your pool. If that's what you're, if that's where you're at in life. Yeah. Yeah. And those people have to live somewhere. And they sure as hell ain't going to commute three hours to come clean your pool. Yeah. Now, if they're making $52 an hour, they might. But how is that business actually going to stay in business? How is that sustainable? Yeah. Right? So we're trying to figure out a way that is a little outside the box thinking, supportive again of our culture and our staff, give them a way to home ownership if that's what they want, and make them feel like they're working towards something. And we are also vested in their future as well. All right, so we got one more question right. uh, coming from Mr. Berto remotely. So he wants to know about, you know, how you go about managing expectations. So by managing expectations, we're talking expectations of customers, expectations of possibly yourself, mm. you know, and uh, and staff, you know. So so how do you, you know, is there a starting point? How do we go about that? You know, how, what would you say? Uh, well, 
I would initially I would always say like when you say managing expectations, that's something that's personal, right? Yeah. It's like an opinion. Okay. Right. So, uh, you can always over expect and be disappointed. But the other side of that is I feel like if you, for us, me, I notice that people will rise to the level of expectation you put on them as long as it's consistent. Okay. Right. You can never deviate from the consistency. Um, the customer expectation is kind of easy. They're expecting a transactional relationship and we're actually trying to form a relationship with them. So the expectation they come is like, I give you money. I want food. We completely flip that upside down and we like get personal with them a little bit. Some people don't want that, but that's fine. But I think for me and Berto, for you, maybe, (laughs) um, you, it can be fueled with disappointment, right? Because you put this on yourself. You put this weight on yourself. Like you have this expectation of X sure, and then you don't hit it. Um, and then you, it's fueled with disappointment. And so I think that I always go out at something like with a really high level of what I want to do, how I want to execute something. But I, I kind of taper it a little bit with what's executable consistently. And then that's how I reached that expectation. So like when we bought the business, I knew I wanted it to be this. Like, I, I don't know what the right word, I don't want to say like, I want it to be this successful, you know, high revenue generating thing. It's not what I really wanted. What I really wanted was I wanted to create an environment of a culture that would change the workplace that could be repeatable in any industry. So to do that required me every day to be consistent with that. I always am fully committed to that. That's my starting point. I start with committing to the culture. And then I see the fruits of that. It takes time, you know, like the mustard seed, it takes time to grow, but it happens. And then I, because I have issues, I have to raise that expectation (laughs) again. I have to go next level. Um, Of course. But you got to taper it with, you you know, you have to be ready to be disappointed. I guess I, I, what I like to say is there really is no bad failure. Right, you guys are doing a great thing You're out there, podcast and getting your message out. I love that, um, and you put a great product out, and it's consistent, and th- the innuendos and all the little things that are happening behind the scenes that no one knows about. Sure, I think the challenge there is, you should try new things. You should try things differently. You you should just try everything, taste everything you can. Yeah, um, and the expectation is if you put that heavy weight on you and you're constantly carrying it around and you never really get it, what you, what you want, then you're just going to be disappointed and start kicking rocks and just be upset. Yeah. So I think managing that for me is I pick one thing and, and I'm dialed in on that all the time, every time for me, it's culture, employee culture. Yeah. That's my number one thing. I never will deviate from it ever. Okay. Um, and so I think that, it's kind of long-winded bird. I hope you got something out of that. I hope you got something out of that. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I honestly did. I mean, that's a great point. You, you you set the expectation based on what can be replicated and what can, you know, you, you don't want the, if you set an expectation to be something like, I'm trying to sell 4,000, you know, hot dogs by 12 noon. Right. That's something that can't, you know, if you ever did that once, bravo, sounds exactly. damn near impossible, but is that something that you could do consistently to, to create an expectation out of that. Right. Can I do that? And can I teach another person to do it also? Yeah. True. And that you know. is where it's at. I'm happy to sell one. Yeah. If that one is exactly made the same way a million times, one. Yeah. We'll get to the 4,000. Sure. It has to come. It yeah. will come. Yeah, yeah. Um, but we you have to just do one. Yeah. And can you, you know, uh, teach it to someone else if that person finishes school and moves on, because now you got to start over again. So it's not like you're teaching one person, you know, uh, one time. Right. You're you're teaching that person and then teaching their replacement and teaching their replacement. Exactly. You the know, number so. one ingredient in our kitchen is effort. That's the number one ingredient in our kitchen. We require that effort. Damn, I love that. The number one ingredient in our kitchen is effort. Hands down. Damn, I think uh, I think we can end on that. That's that's merch. Yeah. <laughs> you heard it here. You heard it here first. Listen, 
Cause you know, man. Thank you. You're the man, dude. I don't know about that. Come on, man. I appreciate you being on here. I appreciate you allowing me to set up in this beautiful sunroom of yours. Yeah, and, man. Thank you. You know, me. and uh, and coming by to see you. And I hope everybody enjoyed the podcast. It's uh, this episode will be up very soon. Um, you know, huh? One sixty one. One sixty one. Nice. Episode one sixty one. This is our third year. Uh, yeah. So episode 161, uh, masses and none podcast is, uh, you know, this is not live, but I will premiere it. So we'll present as though nice. it's a, it's a live, uh, live video in a I'll sense. I'll put it that, on all my social. Yeah. Awesome. You know, we appreciate you for that. And, and guys, anybody that's watching this, uh, give the video a thumbs up, make sure you subscribe to the channel, hit the notification bell. So every time we have a premiere of a video or we go live, you don't miss an episode and you can check us out. As I stated in the beginning of the podcast on all audio podcast platforms from Spotify to Apple podcast, Google play store. And we are now on iHeartRadio as well. Podbean, Stitcher, anywhere that you consume your favorite audio podcast. And if you don't find us on that podcast, jump in the, di I'm sorry. If you don't find us on that mm. uh, platform, you can jump onto the Discord, which will also be linked in the description. We have a lot of different, you know, subcategories on there so people can suggest topics for us to discuss. They can post stuff for us, memes, videos they want us to react to, things like that. And you can also stay up to date with how the, the channel is doing. So thank you to my co-host for the day because a little more than a guest here co-host uh my cousin mike owner of the dog house and we appreciate you guys so that's it twiz and berto i will be back soon and we will you know do this again maybe maybe all right Thank appreciate you, you guys me. of course man come on cuz all right that's what we got masses and podcast episode 161